my story. Get the best version. I got <laughs> 40 minutes. God. We might get out a little early. <clears throat> um, <laughs> how many of y'all ever told God, I'll follow you, but I'm not going to do that? Am I the only one? <clears throat> this is what I said I wouldn't do. So, <clears throat> If y'all were here during Pastor's anniversary, I talked a lot about my grandfather. When he died, I was 14. Okay, so my mother, she started search for God. We'd be in the car, she'd be driving around town. And she'd stop in the parking lot, she's like, okay, she goes, come on, come on, let's go. So then we go to another church. I'm like, man, what is wrong with my mother? Something is wrong with my mother. So, she starts going to church. Now, my dad, he wasn't going, so that means we didn't have to go. <laughs> so it, it probably took a few months, and he started going. And you know once dad started going, everybody going. We all going. So I get to the church, and I'm, I'm 14, 14, 15 years old, so I grew up pretty quick. I, I seen a lot of things I probably shouldn't have seen at that age, but I did. Uh, my Parents went through a lot. <clears throat> so when I got to the church, I was like, what in the world is going on in here? These people is mumbling and talking in funny languages. And there's a lady over here, and she got ribbons and stuff. She's <laughs> going around. I'm like, man, what is going on? So I'm like, this, ain't, this ain't like uh, Fred Price, what I see on TV with my grandpa. This ain't nothing like that. I don't know what this is. So fast forward, I start going to youth group. And I'm, like I said, I was hanging on the corner with my friends. Just, I wasn't a bad kid, but, you know, I was, I was a teenager. So I seen these kids, and they were weird. They were doing this. And I'm like, why are they raising their hands? What is going on? So uh, the youth pastor, he was, he, was, he was a good guy. He was a real good guy. He would talk about, you have a purpose. God has something for you to do. Da, 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 da. I'm like, I ain't never heard nothing like that before. Purpose, huh? I wonder what my purpose is. So I remember he was praying. He was like, man, who wants to speak in tongues? I'm like, not me. I don't know nothing about that. I don't want to know anything about that. That's weird. So he prayed for me one day, and I, you know, I started speaking in tongues or whatever. And I remember one day, <clears throat> I still thought a lot of, a lot of stuff in the church was kind of weird. So I remember one day. I'm in my room, and my mom comes in there, and she's got a bottle of <clears throat> olive oil in her hand. I'm like, what are you doing? She comes over to me in the bed. She don't explain anything. She just <laughs> puts her hands on my head and starts praying, and she's speaking in tongues. I'm like, I'm like this. <laughs> oh, my mother. So then um, she brought, I remember she brought me uh, <laughs> A Christian rap tape. Tape is like, it's a little thing that you put in. Okay. So she brought me this tape, and I'm listening, at the time I'm listening to all the gangster rap stuff. And I put that in there, I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, this ain't, this ain't it. God has to have something better than that. So I, I didn't listen to whatever. So uh, <clears throat> fast forward, this evangelist came to town, and... He was, I think he was from Cleveland, I want to say Cleveland. His name was Joseph Jennings, and he was a former gangster, and he was into that life or whatever. And so he talked about how God saved him. And we're at a high school, and I remember me and my dad both got saved that same night together. We walked down there together. So I got saved. I was 15, going on 16. I had God, but God, he didn't have me. So, I was going to public school at the time, and uh, I was, a lot of my friends were getting into drugs and drinking and all this kind of stuff, and I was like, man, I don't want that. My, my father went through that kind of stuff. I've seen what it can do, so I'm like, I, I'm out. So, I go transfer to this Christian school my mom wanted me to go to, <clears throat> and so, I get there, and, 
man, them kids are just as jacked up as the ones over here. I'm like, I mean, <laughs> these, all these preachers' kids, and they just, I'm like, man, do your daddy know you're doing all this? So, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about college. I wasn't. I wasn't the best student just because I wasn't focused. It wasn't that I was dumb or anything. I just, it was about basketball and girls. That's all high school is about for most people, most guys. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> I went, one of my teachers, she took, uh, she took, she took me under a wing, man. She was, she was great. I was going to have to go back to um, public school and she, out of her paycheck, which you know teachers don't make a lot, she paid half of my tuition for me to stay there. So she's like, "You think about college?" I'm like, "No, nah, not really." You know, she's like, "We should go. Let's go to Oklahoma. I went to school down at Coharie, Old Roberts." And uh, so we came down here on college weekend. So we came down here, checked it out. I was like, "Oh, this is cool," you know. And uh, applied, and I got in. Now I got in on academic probation. They said, you can come, but you're going to have to work because your, <laughs> your grades is all jacked up. But they must have seen something other than that. So I get to ORU, and things are going good. I become a chaplain. I'm a chaplain. I had God, but God still didn't have me. So I'm holding devotionals once a week in the dorm and uh, still struggling with normal things people struggle with, you know, and I'm thinking, man, but I'm not as bad as that guy, you know. You know how church people are, you know, you want to, this sin is up here, but this sin is, it's all right, you know, because that's the one you're struggling with. So anyway, so I leave school and a friend of mine starts a church. It was a disaster. <laughs> it ended bad, and it just put a bad taste in my mouth about church. And um, so then we go to start go to I start going to another church. That's where I met my wife. She was with another guy, but I had to take her. <laughs> I had to take her. I took her. <laughs> you know, you know, I took her. You know, I took her. Anyway, so. Yeah, that's, that was my woman right there. I knew. So, so we were at this church, and no, it's just a disaster. I'm like, man, what is going on? And I'm, and I'm with God, but I'm not with God. You know what I'm saying? So we leave that church. We stop going to church. We go through all kind of hell in our marriage with everything. And, you know, you're trying to do things on your own. You're like, church people are crazy. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Because <laughs> if that's what following God is, I don't want to follow him. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, fast forward, 2013. I show up here. My daughter was dancing. Um, Aunt Pat had brought her. I can't even remember what it was. But she, was she came up here and she was dancing in some kind of program. So me and my wife sat over here. And I just felt at home. And I, I felt like, this is, the pastor got up and spoke, and I was like, man, that's, that dude is real. He's not playing, he ain't no joking, he's just real. And uh, I just knew this is where I was, where I was supposed to be. So, I'm going to show y'all what our first, probably two years of coming here was like. This is me and my wife in the pew. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Baby, what'd he say? <laughs> uh, so I had to tell her everything he said, and then I missed the next part. So this is about four or five more times in the start. Baby, what'd he say? He said, uh, if a wife doesn't obey her husband, she goes to hell. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yes, he did. Uh, all right, so fast forward, 
pastor starts talking about he's going to start doing some discipleship. So as soon as he said the word, I knew he was talking about me. He didn't even have to look at me. I just knew. So I'm meeting in his office, and we're going through, and he's teaching me lots of stuff, stuff I've never even thought about, never heard. And so, like he said, he, one day he said, so when do you think you're going to preach? And I think I said, I don't know. I, I, I'm not ready for that yet. And he was like, okay, I'm not, no pressure, no pressure, you know. And I'm like, okay, good. So fast forward, I don't know, a few months later, he said, you ready to preach? And I think I, think I said, maybe, something like that. But when I was walking back to the car, I was thinking, this dude is crazy. <laughs> I am not going to preach. <laughs> uh, I know Pastor fasts a lot. Maybe his blood sugar was a little low. He didn't hear. <laughs> He's not hearing from you on this. <laughs> okay. So a couple weeks go by. I'm walking. I'm, I met with Pastor. I'm walking out. Elder Gary says, hey, JJ, hey, how you doing, Elder Gary? Can you come in for a minute? I'm like thinking, you know, Elder Gary going to say something about the youth room. He's messed up or something. He said, take a seat. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so uh, when you going to preach? I said, oh, so y'all going to double team me now, right? <laughs> so before I'm in the counselor's office, now I'm in the principal's office. And he gives me some advice on what to do. I said, you know, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. You know, da, 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 da. So, uh, pastor says, so in October, I'm leaving. I want you to preach. I said, okay. Uh, he texts me. He says, you want the third or the 10th? I said, the 10th. They'll give you more time, you know. <laughs> and he said, good. I'll be back. I'll be there. I said, dang, I should have picked the third. <laughs> what was I thinking? Why didn't I pick the third? <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> that's how I got up here. That's, that's the condensed story. Man, that, I thought that was going to take longer than that. Okay. All right. So let's, let's go to Acts 3. Acts 3. Curtis was like, ooh, I'm glad he picked the tenth. I could do the third. <clears throat> when y'all got it, let me know. Somebody say, say something. All right. All right, we're going to go through this. Yeah, we're definitely going to get out early. Okay. Uh, we're in one through eight. Okay. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in three o'clock prayer service. As they approach the temple, wait, let, me, let me go back. So there's, there's a few things that happen in this, in, this, in this story. There's an expectation, there's an alteration, and then there's a revelation. Okay? All right, here we go. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Expectations. Expectations. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. Expectations. Expectations. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. He said it right there. Expectations. Now, why did Peter say, look at us? Uh, what do y'all do when y'all see a beggar at Quick Trip? When you get off the highway, they stand there. Y'all don't look at him. Y'all be like this. <laughs> <laughs> you walk in a Quick Trip. <sighs> you don't go through the door. They stand You go to the side door. You Peter said, look at us, because Peter knew what he was getting ready to say and give him was going to change his life. I remember when I was coaching myself basketball team, I 
called Loki. All right, you go in. And I say, okay, when you go in, don't, don't foul. Don't just move your feet. Don't reach. Da, da, da. Okay, look at me. They go right out there and do the exact opposite of what I said. <laughs> so Peter knew what he was going to give him was going to be change his life, not just I can give you a couple of dollars. You know, uh, when, I, when I saw this, I was like, God, is that really what you want me to preach about? And I said, give me confirmation. So this is, I don't know, maybe a month ago, there was a lady out here. I don't know if y'all remember. There was a lady and her son out here. And Miss Pat, Miss Gwen, she, she came into the little foyer right there. Miss Pat, Miss Gwen, they gave her Jesus. They prayed for her. They talked to her. They prayed for her. I gave her a couple dollars. She had a kid with her, and I was like, man, I got to give her something. I can't send her away with nothing. She's got a kid. So that was my confirmation about this, about this message. Okay, where did I end off at? All right. Um, let's see. Uh, verse 6. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk alteration. He was expecting to get some money. He was expecting to be sitting there all day getting money. He knew that if he sat right there at that gate, because he'd been there every day, so you don't go somewhere where you know you're not going to get nothing. You know, and in Jewish culture, the, the more you give, the more godly you are, right? So he knew where he was going and why he was there. He was, he was trying to get some money. He'd accepted being, being lame. He, is, he had accepted that. Okay. So, um, let's see where that is. Okay. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he, oh, I'm sorry. But I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. That's alteration. Now, then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Revelation. Now he knows he can do it. He sees the change. He knows that, man, now I can walk. I came here for something, and I got something completely different. He had an expectation. Peter and John gave him an alteration. And God showed him a revelation. But there's something else that God does if you allow him to. Verse 8. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Transformation. Transformation. Transformation is where most Christians get stuck. We get saved. We say, okay, God, it's, I need you. But we never transform. Never transform. You go to church, you start doing things. I'm this. I'm the whatever. I'm not going to say your title because you're going to think I'm talking about you. <laughs> Just because you go to church does not mean you have been transformed. Transformation is not about doing for God. It's about sitting at his feet and having an intimate relationship with him. And then that leads to doing for him. But we, we do it backwards. We want to do for him <laughs> to get some brownie points or whatever. So... Sitting at his feet is where you will find the mind of Christ. We think how we want to think. And then we sprinkle a little Christianity into it. We know what the word says. But let a situation come where you have to use it and you say, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not doing that. I won't do what I want to do. 
Bible says, pray for your leaders. Yes, we criticize them. Can you be in church for 20, 30, 40 years and still never be transformed? There's a couple scriptures uh, I want y'all to write down. These are transformation scriptures. Romans 12, 2. Y'all can read them when y'all get home. Got it? Amen. I still hear some papers rustling. Okay. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Yes, sir. Like I said before, we think how we want to think. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new Person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Yes, sir. What do people say when they see your life? Do they say, man, whatever they got, I, I need, I, I got to have what they have. Or do they say, mm -mm, I don't want what they got. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Does Christ live in you? Are you transformed or are you just going through the motions? You can come here on Sunday, you can come here on Wednesday, and you can even come here on Monday nights and never be transformed. All right, I'm going to tell you a story of the good room. We got 20 minutes left. <clears throat> Y'all know the good room in the house. Back in the day, in your grandma's house, you couldn't go in there. There was plastic on the. <laughs> sat on it, you get stuck to the seat. Don't you go in that good room. <laughs> Just imagine you're a house. And outside of the house is Jesus Christ. And he just wants to come in. But he ain't going to force his way in. He wants you to open the door and let him in. Yeah. And the reason we won't let him in is a lot of people. You know, most of this Bible was wrote to the church, right? So... The reason you won't let him in is because the house stinks. It's filthy. And another reason you won't let him in is because you fine with the way things are. You go over to the door, tell him what you need, close the back door, go back in. And then there's other people that used to have Jesus all in the house. Now, for some reason or other, he's in that one room, the good room. And that's where you keep them. You don't let them out the room. And in that room, it's nice in there. Suit, you got your suit on. Is that good? You know, Sunday morning. 
You walk in, you're looking good. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, brother. <laughs> but the rest of your house is filthy. Transformation is not about what happens when you come in to South Florida. Transformation is about what happens when you go out. Because we all on our best behavior on Sundays and Wednesdays and Mondays. But what is your life saying when you leave here? And then there's those who Jesus He's all in the house. But as soon as he starts walking to this one room, you're like, mm-mm, you can't go in there. You got a lock on it, a chain around it. I don't know what's in the room. There's no telling what's in that room. But you won't give whatever's in that room to God because you want to hold on to it. He just wants to come in. He's standing out there with an apron and a bucket ready to come in and clean it all out. Why won't we let him? The Bible says that few will enter. Few. So all the works that we're doing, is it going to get us in? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. All those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name, and we perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Can you imagine going through your walk with God and <laughs> you think you're good and you, you get up to heaven and he says, I never knew you? That's scary. The question is now, who wants the transformation? the transformation. I want you to ask yourself, have I been transformed or am I just going through the motions? Like I said before, transformation is much more than what we're doing. Everybody would bow their head and close their eyes for me for a second. If you know you are one of those scenarios I talked about when I talked about transformation, maybe you've never let him in, maybe he's in that one room, maybe he's walking and you won't let him go into the room that you're holding on to. If this is you, I want you to raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. All right, you can put your hands down. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I want you to come up here, and we're going to pray. I know there's voices telling you not to, but come on up here. We're going to pray.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I don't know which scenario you are, but God knows. So I'm going to pray. Let the transformation happen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for guiding us each and every day, Father God. Lord, we ask that we would sit at your feet, Lord God. We won't become busy with doing for you what we don't know you. Lord, I ask for the ones that came up here, Lord, that you would just transform them, Father God. That you will come in and clean each and every inch of their house. I pray that you will change their minds, Father God. That they will think differently. That they will think the way that you Lord, I ask that you would guide them, Father God. Thank you for their lives. And for those who may have been too afraid to come up, I pray for them as well. Lord, I ask that you would be with those people, Father God. Guide their footsteps, Lord Jesus. Do a complete transformation, Father God. I include myself in this prayer, Father God. A complete transformation, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you. There's none like you. We can't do it on our own, Lord. We need you. We do not want to get in your presence and you tell us that you never need us. Transform us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Ten minutes left. Uh, I just want to say this is extremely humble. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Pastor, for believing in me enough to let me come up here. And um, God bless you all. Thank you.